The Polynesian Triangle reaches from Hawaii in the north and at its southerly base lie New Zealand in the west and Easter Island to the east. Within this ocean triangle are more than 1,000 islands of all shapes and sizes and they appear like a skeletal hand that reaches out to draw in the early people of the islands. The indigenous people are Polynesian and share many similar traits, including language, culture and beliefs. Historically, they were skilled sailors who knew how to read the stars and the moon to navigate and how to use the great currents of the sea. They designed outrigger canoes in which to travel vast distances and carry many people, plants and animals. They fearlessly explored the vast Pacific Ocean. Archaeological evidence indicates that early Polynesian seafarers emerged from an ancient Austronesian culture at around 3000 BC and settled nearly every inhabitable island in the South Pacific. They were led by a hierarchy of chiefs and their tribes had skilled warriors who were highly feared. Some lived by the sea and yet others lived high in the valleys. They lived colourful lives, made wood carvings, were constantly fighting and cannibalised their enemies. They covered their bodies with geometric patterns of tattoos and when children reached puberty they underwent elaborate rites of passage. Over the centuries great traditions evolved and with these traditions they elaborated their gods, music, dance, myths and legends. Legends and folklore were told and retold by way of dance and song. Polynesian dance is exuberant and vibrant and has a long history of cultural significance. Many of these dances are associated with specific events and occasions and there are multiple dance styles. Traditional Polynesian song and dance was inspired by the gods. A female dancer was wrapped in tapa cloth decorated with feathers, shells and mother-of-pearl, while the male was adorned with only a few feathers and a loincloth or penis sheath. Polynesians were inspired by the natural sounds of the earth, the pounding of the ocean, the wind rustling the trees, the roll of the thunder and the rhythm of the rain. They mimicked these sounds with drums, conch shells, gourds and harmonic nasal flutes. Chanting became a means of communicating with the gods in time with the music and they devised hand movements to tell the story. Dances were created naturally as a formal extension of common human gestures and they combined the chant with a strongly rhythmic powerful beat. In Polynesia, where the volcanic and coral land lacks clay for pottery, Gourds were extensively used for many purposes and gourd drums were used to accompany chanting during festive and spiritual occasions. The pahu drum was made from a coconut tree trunk and shark skin. Due to its height, it is played from the standing position, using both hands, similar to the way conga drums are played. This drum had numerous uses, to encourage warriors during a fight and to accompany and to give rhythms to the marae ceremonies. The Toa Ere drum was constructed from a hollowed log of Polynesian native trees like the Milo, Kumani and Kui. The Toa Ere drum varies in size from a few inches in length to a few feet. The deeper sounds are made from the larger Toa Ere and it is played by beating on the log with a wooden cone shaped stick. The Hihara is a bamboo split in thin strips and hit with two drumsticks. The Tari Parawi is a bass drum and hit with the hands to give little offbeats or vibrations. Nose flutes, vivo, are made from bamboo tubes with holes carved into them. The vivo is a three-hole bamboo flute, has a wonderful sound and is played by exhaling out of the nose and into the flute. A footed drum of coconut tree trunk and shark skin is characterized by an open area at the bottom of the instrument that is held by the feet. This open area adds resonance to the drum sound. The conch, called a pu, is blown like a horn to create a deep reverberating note. A pate is a slit drum and produces a loud, very distinctive sound. Different sizes of pate offer different pitches and volumes by virtue of striking the pate in the middle or near its ends. These traditional instruments and music styles have been used to accompany dancing for centuries. 
Mythology has it that the world has always existed. As they put it, forever has been forever. Similarly, so had darkness and so had the sea. The earth could only be changed at the hands of the gods. In the early ages, dance performances were symbolic and full of significance and were not just an art form. Polynesian people had different dances for different occasions. Dances were directly linked with all aspects of life. There was a dance that was performed to greet guests at an official ceremony. One might dance just for the sheer joy of it or for prayer and there were worshipping dances dedicated to the gods. Some dances were more personal and people danced to challenge an adversary to combat or to seduce and entice a potential mate. The dances can be slow and sensual, fast paced and vigorous, but all were mesmerizing. Myths and legends were also acted out like theatrical performances. Death was marked by the ritual dancing of wailing women and chanting by men. Women would also perform a specific dance called a heva. During this dance, they would take off all their clothes and move in an extremely exaggerated and suggestive manner. Then the female relatives of the deceased would do physical harm to themselves by cutting their hands and faces with shark's teeth and sharp objects. All very strange. Dance had a central part in Polynesian culture for centuries before the European missionaries arrived and maintaining the age-old styles after that wasn't always easy. Early natives had complex systems of religion, etiquette, social structure and artistry, which included dance and music. Then the missionaries came and intimidated the local rulers of the island and somehow established themselves in a position of power. They then tried to abolish such practices as infanticide, cannibalism and tribal wars. The good missionaries then introduced the idea of sin, which was unknown to the Polynesian world. The people were made to wear clothes, and soon the joy of dancing, so dear to the Polynesian heart, was difficult to maintain. This ancient art form was forced underground, along with the knowledge of how to make dance costumes from vegetable fibres, shells and flowers. But despite setbacks and restrictions to this artistic expression, dancing went on and the level of secrecy depended on the missionary inspired laws at the time. That dancing survived at all is testimony to its importance to the Polynesians. It was primarily due to the onset of tourism in the 20th century that the colonizers occasionally allowed sanitized versions of the traditional dances to be performed. But it wasn't until the mid part of the 20th century that the true revival of dance began. Interest in original costume design soon followed and dance eventually resumed its rightful place as a vibrant part of Polynesian culture. Nevertheless, many years of suppression had left its mark and although the old ideas and the same steps were still there, the upa upa or earthy spirit of the old did not really exist anymore. Dancers of today wear elaborate headdresses. Skirts are low slung with a wide belt. The women are decorated with mother of pearl, shells, natural fibers and colorful seeds. Intoxicating tropical flower scents fill the air from the flowers wall. Slit and bass drums pound out sensual rhythms, accompanying unmistakable acts spelled out in a timeless language. This island music is beautiful to listen to and has a distinct romantic style in telling of love and romance and is strongly rhythmic, complex, athletic and powerful. Men had to wrestle or fight for the opportunity to become husbands to the most beautiful women. But these struggles were seldom to the death. It was more in keeping with the tradition, having the underlying principle that no man should have a wife until he had proved that he is able to protect her. Myths and legends were often acted out through the traditional dance. During the dance, special emphasis was also placed on the chanting, for alongside the body and hand movements, the chanting told the story. The hura was a dance for women, 
and has long since almost disappeared, along with the couple's dance, the Upa Upa. The Otea is a war dance and is one of those which existed in pre-European times as a male-only dance. Nowadays, the Otea is danced by both sexes and is easily recognized by its fast hip shaking. During the Hivinao, the dancers move in circles to the beat of the drums and they sing in unison. It is the easiest of the dances and technically less demanding. It's generally slower, a more graceful dance which focuses more on the hands and tells stories of daily life on land and on the sea. The Aparima is danced in rows. Scenes of daily life are mimed, using intricate hand movements and gestures. The dance uses drums only, there is no singing, and the dancers mimic scenes from everyday life. They make gestures recalling ordinary occupations. For the men, the themes can be chosen from hunting or fishing to warfare or sailing, and they may use spears or paddles. For women, the themes are more personal, involving hair combing or enticing and encouraging a warrior to court or seduce her. The pa'a is a sensual dance, with a couple dancing in the center of a half circle of other dancers, sitting on the ground, clapping to the beat. This dance was used as a premarital dance to build courage for a young couple to take on the challenge of marriage. In the days before wearing of clothes, this dance was probably less necessary. The tamaure is danced by boys and girls, each dressed in grass from the fibers from the bark of the hibiscus tree. The boys shake their knees in pa'oti movements, a scissors motion, and the girls shake their hips provocatively with their hair hanging long and loose. It was, and still is, common for young men and women to spend much time ornamenting, mutilating, painting and tattooing themselves in order to attract favorable attention as potential marriage partners. When a bride was chosen, a sensual dance was performed and later the bride's screams, tears and struggles, which were merely a part of the marriage routine, were essential to show her bashfulness and modesty. Costume has always been very important. There are three different types of costumes. One for the chief, which has to be different from the dancers. One for the dancers themselves, and one for the musicians. Headdress for the chiefs was markedly different from the rest of the tribe, signifying status within the tribe, and often adorned with huge feathers. Throughout Polynesia, much of the creative energy of the people flow into words that are woven into songs and stories about gods and heroes, that is, those who have the strength and the power. Formerly, they also told of mortal men and women and wove them all into the tales of history. They ennobled these distinguished ancestors and gave them the names and attributes of gods. Words were spun into welcoming orations, love lyrics, laments, and eulogies of praise for the great chiefs, warriors and navigators, particularly those who led the canoe parties to find new lands. An image of the fisherman god was engraved on the bow of every fishing canoe and offerings were made to him prior to setting out. Ritual words were guarded by priests and by the master craftsmen who acted as priests for the canoe builders, house builders, fishermen and the makers of images. Prayers summoned gods to the marae, or ceremonial sites. Invocations, charms and spells used words in formulas so precise that if any were omitted or misplaced, disaster and death followed. Legends and myths were passed through the generations in many ways, always through the oral tradition, since there was no written language. There were the words of a lullaby for the baby, the stories for curious children, or simply tales to pass the idle time of day. For the Western ear, the stories are confused and confusing, but there is almost always a common thread to the tales, namely that the gods and other spirits are in charge of everything and it doesn't do to irritate them. There were legends of Hina, the woman who beat tapper cloth on the moon, Maui, who fished up the islands from the seabed and snared the sun, of Tinirao, whose pet whale was murdered by Kai, 
Tawaki, who visited the sky, and Rata, whose canoe was built by the little people of the forest. As the early Polynesians crossed the vast Pacific in search of new land, they carried with them the knowledge of the great mythological events, the names of their gods and of their many ancestors that they danced to in worship. They danced to appease their gods, to mark knives milestones, to celebrate a victory, or simply just for the joy of dancing. Legend has it that the volcano goddess Pele was bored one day and didn't want to dance, and her little sister Hiaka was ordered to perform the dance for her. Another story has it that Pele created the dance to celebrate her escape from her older sister. Regardless of which of these myths is true, it is clear that the origin of this dance was testimony to the fact that Pele was somewhat capricious and should not be crossed. Despite the fact that the Polynesians believed that the world has always existed, there seemed to be a number of stories that would indicate that perhaps there were some who believed in some sort of creation. There were a number of evolutionary and creation figures in the Polynesians' ancient beliefs. There was Tumunui, a major god in the creation myth. He and his wife were responsible for creating the pillars that held up the sky, called Arumia, and Fati, the god who created the moon and stars. There was Rua, the sun god, who was also the father of Fati. Tangaroa was a great god, the god who made the sea, and Ara Tio Tio, the Polynesian deity who created the tornado, was much feared by seafarers. Great respect was given to Aumakua, the spirit of the ancestors. Early beliefs talked of each person having two souls. When the earthly soul dies, it remains earthbound and descends to the underworld, to Avaiki. Alternately, the Aumakua, or higher soul, ascends to the heavens to rejoin the deceased ancestors. There was also Aitumatupapua, whose earthborn son, Oho Utu, having climbed to the heaven tree to meet his father, was torn apart by his jealous siblings and eaten. Then there was Hanui Orangi, the Polynesian wind god, the father of the winds. Theology was a complex business. It got no less complex after the arrival of the Christian missionaries because the Polynesians simply amalgamated the beliefs of the new religion into the old. It's now very simple. You believe in the one God of Christianity, but you also believe in the hundred and one gods of the ancient religion. Maui is an island in Hawaii and is named after a hero in ancient Polynesian mythology. Maui and his mother worked very hard and always had much to accomplish, but the days were too short. There never was enough sunlight to extend the hours in the day. Maui wanted to provide his mother with more daylight, and he thought that if the sun was to move slower across the sky, there would be more hours of light in each day. Maui decided to cut off the sacred tresses of his wife Hina to make a rope to catch the sun as it was rising in the morning sky. He did this, and once he had lassoed the sun with the tresses of Hina's lovely hair, he then mercilessly beat the sun with the magic jawbone of his dead grandmother. The sun was so weak after the beating that afterwards it could only creep along its daily course. Maui, in his clever way, made the sunlight last longer, and it was possible for his mother to work longer each day. What she was working at, and why, is not made clear. Hawaii Iki is the treasured fable of the original homeland of the Polynesians. This folklore is related to the place from where we all came. A very long time ago, the great sea was not so deep, and the land spread over only two very big islands, like two giant turtles floating in the water. One of these was high up on the Earth's shoulders in cold water. No one cared to make a home on that shell. Only wild beasts and perhaps some magical people lived there. The other island basked in the warmth of the sun at the belt of the Earth. In their old way of speaking, the people who lived on this southern turtle shell called it Aina Momo Maakani, Fat Land of God. For them, everything was good 
and everyone was happy. There was little need for work, mostly people could just do as they pleased with no one or nothing to bother them. Then everything changed. On an unusually cold morning, much dew appeared on all the plants. The earth slipped on a wet hibiscus and fell onto its back. The great white giant who slept in the shadows at the top of the world woke up and found himself under the rays of the hot sun. To escape the sun, he slid into the water. The water rose and the other gods roared in anger at being disturbed. It all made a great commotion. It was the ancient mythical equivalent of climate change. When everything finally settled down, the people found there were very few of them left, and they were no longer living on a great turtleback, but were instead on the scattered fragments of that shell. These became the many, many small islands, and the stars above them in the night sky were now those which were once only seen much further south, below the belt of the earth. The people were anxious to learn what had happened to their homeland. They built strong canoes from big trees that still floated around the islands to go in search of their old land. They discovered that the sea had given them another present. Thousands of small coral islets that were everywhere, like long strings of pearls, marking trails from one group of islands to another. They could not find their old land, but continued the search year after year. Following a string of islets, they rediscovered, far to the south, a big chunk of their old place named Maota Te Aroa, Land of the Long White Cloud, and later named New Zealand. The sea rose again, and many of the coral islets died. The string of pearl trails between the island groups vanished. With all of the changes, it became more and more difficult to find pieces of the old ancestral home. Finally, all earth moving ended. They went out to sea again and found one last string of islands leading northward and the people found some of the big turtle island that had always lain in the north but now moved into warmer waters. It reminded them so much of their old land that they called it Hawaii Iki or Hawaii. The islands of Polynesia lie in that part of the Pacific called the Ring of Fire that experiences earthquakes, tsunamis and cyclones, the hurricanes of the Pacific. And it is no wonder that there is the legend of the cyclone. When the black mountains split apart like a coconut beneath a stone, the wind blew, the sea spread across the plains, the sky was black as night and crossed by red lightning bolts. The Milky Way was about to spill its sparkling torrents onto the earth. The woods were coming asunder, the stars cried in a sinister way. Paila, the daughter of Tomahu, the wife of Daori, is seated, her sons on her lap in a mountain ravine. They hear the storm that is more terrible than a thousand wars. It is the cyclone. Before her, the earth splits, torrents without end pour in. Behind her and to the right and left are abysses. The water rises, rises, and reaches as high as the clouds. The clouds get lower. The water from the clouds and the sea mix together, higher than the highest of trees. There they are like the mountains of night. On her head is the great rain, beneath her feet the rising sea, around her the bottomless chasms. She wraps herself around her little ones to keep them from the water. Her rounded back covers them like a cave. She speaks to them gently so that they are not frightened. The children smile, safe next to their mother. She looks into the darkness but can see the land no more. On the sea, floating trees and corpses pass by, going to the ends of the earth. Men, women and children of her tribe are laid out as if sleeping but they're dead. The water rages thus for five risings of the moon without seeing the sun. The heavens are black, the water falls and still falls from the sky. Paila's sons are nourished with her milk. They survive. Rocks collapse around them. The mountains are but shadowy fringes. 
the earth seems very small. Paella looks out with her black eyes. She doesn't tremble, for she is the daughter and sister of, and a wife of a warrior. Paella's sons must not die. They must become men, and they must fight to survive. All are now dead in the valley. There are now tribes without people. Days pass, yet her sons live, clutching the brown-haired Paella's neck. They float on her corpse, like on a dugout canoe. Paella was wounded in the storm, and while dying, had ordered her sons to quench their thirst on her blood. Finally, the storm ends, the seas grow calm, and they drift to an island with towering peaks and turquoise lagoons. There they find the daughters of Tana Owe and the old white-haired Tomahu. When they are grown, the old man marries the daughters of Tana Owe to the sons of Paila. They bear many children. So many moons pass that they cannot be counted. The old man, Tomaho, lulls the grandchildren of Paila to sleep with songs and the telling of the great storm, of the brave Paila who will never more rise from where she sat. She is forever remembered for braving the storm and saving her sons. And that is the legend of the first cyclone. It has taken millions of years to shape these more than 1,000 islands, which now display an astonishing range of terrain. From steep, wind-swept cliffs to deep bays, tall peaks that pierce the sky above stunning waterfalls tumbling down sheer mountainsides, white sand beaches that edge the crystalline turquoise lagoons of warm water, where coloured fish and giant manta rays stir the coral gardens lush tropical slopes and valleys with green hills, tiny atolls that lie like a string of pearls on the Azure Sea. Everywhere, frangipani and hibiscus scent fills the air. Tranquility reigns supreme on these islands of paradise with their translucent lagoons that resemble watery magic carpets threaded with shimmering ribbons of emerald, turquoise and jade. One can sunbathe in seclusion on silky beds of sand where the wind softly caresses one's skin, snorkel amid rainbow-coloured fish and feast on coconuts split open with jagged rocks to suck out the sticky, sweet milk. These Polynesian islands remain comparatively untouched by the modern world and few words can describe this tropical paradise. But it is the perfect place to get lost in. Here, time moves at a crawl. Days slide by in a lazy haze to seduce lovers and adventurers on a quest for the romanticized notion of Polynesia. It is a place filled with legends, mysteries and romantic myth. The legends and myths are so often confusing that one can feel even more mystified in leaving than one was on arrival. But it's all very beautiful. <laughs>